Erev Tov, everyone. We continue our journey through the book of Bereshit. We're in chapter 27, the Beracha that Yitzhak was intending to give to Esav, and it was taken from him by Yaakov. Now, traditionally, in the Orthodox world, based also on some hints on the Torah, Yaakov's act is explained as a positive one. He had to take the, the baracha from Esav because Esav was inept. He wasn't really ready to become the successor of Yitzhak. Yitzhak didn't know what was going on. Um, but I want, to, I want to suggest a different interpretation based on the Tanakh, it's based on the Torah itself and several factors. One, it seems right from the reading of the book of Bereshit that Yaakov's actions come back to haunt him. Everything he did comes back uh, to, and he has to confront it. And that in itself is the, uh, the way of the Torah to tell us that what Yaakov did was wrong. And second, if you carefully read the Psukim, we'll see that Yitzhak actually knew, knew who was Esav and who was Yaakov and maybe had a completely different plan. So I believe that Yitzhak's plan was to have Yaakov and Esav rule together, where Esav is in charge of the, maybe the military campaigns, the political prowess, uh, uh, process, since he was an issue of the outside ish today, he's, uh, he's always outside, he's an outgoing person. And Yaakov might maybe the, the, the spiritual successor, the one who receives Birkat Abraham. And we'll see if we could see through the Psukim. So I mentioned last week that the, the reason it's Haq, I think the, the reason that it's Haq asks Esav to go and get him wild game from the field, he appreciates it more than uh, than goats from his flocks because he liked the, the sense of adventure of being in the outdoors. That's also why he went to, to uh, uh, stroll in the field when he met Rivka for the first time. So we are now in, the, in chapter 27. The first couple of psukim is when yeah, Yitzhak asks Asaf to go and get the food. <clears throat> and now in verse 5, you read, Verivka Shoma'at. The translation here is Rebecca heard when Isaac spoke to Esav, but no, this is but it doesn't say Vatishma Rivka and Rivka heard. It says Verivka Shomaat. And I I feel like it tells us Rivka was always Shomaat when Esav was talking when Yitzhak was talking to Esav. Every time she sees <clears throat> Yitzhak getting ready to talk to Esav. She's, she's alert, what's going on? Is this the moment, is this the time when he's going to tell him he's going to give the bracha? Meaning Rivka knew that this moment is coming. She was always attentive. That's why she didn't miss that moment. So she's eavesdropping or, or she's in the, in the tent. Maybe, maybe that that's even uh, was not done in hiding from Rivka. She's right there in the tent. And it's Hak tells Esav in her presence, Go get me to give a blessing. That's another possibility. Rivka Shomat, meaning Rivka is present. <clears throat> so Esav goes to get game. And in verse 6, Rivka Yaakov ben Alimbo, Rivka tells Yaakov, Overheard your father, or I heard your father talking to Esav, bring me game, venison, make food, and I will bless you before I die. Listen to me, to what I am going to command you. And that phrase already is an indicator that Yaakov was not enthusiastic about stealing the bracha from his brother. Because if it was something that he had plotted together with his mother, she would have said, Right? Here's the opportunity to do what we were waiting for. Instead, she speaks in the commanding voice because she knows that he's going to object. Yeah, this was not Yaakov's plan, it was Rivka's plan. <clears throat> what does she tell him? Go get me two goats from the flock and, and I will prepare them and pretend that it's venison. And indeed, Yaakov objects. Verse 11. 
ויאמר יעקב ורבקה עמו, הן עשו אחי איש שעיר, ואנוכי איש חלק. My brother has smooth, uh, my brother is hairy and I have smooth skin. אולי ימושני אבי, והייתי בעיניי כמתעתע. And the commentators know that אולי sometimes can be, uh, אולי can sometimes be uh, perhaps, not, not just perhaps, but I wish that, right? So, uh, It's almost saying that uh, Yaakov wished for Yitzhak to find out that it's him, Yaakov. And we'll see later on that it's true. So we, Yaakov says, if my father feels me, he will see that I'm, uh, <clears throat> he will see that I'm, uh, I'm uh, deceiving him. Now, see the word, Vaiti be'anav ki Leta'atea is to make someone confused. Later on, when Yosef will go and search for his brothers, the Torah will say, Vayimtsa'ehu ish v'hinet to'e basadeh. Yosef was wandering in the field. So the same verb, ta'atea and to'e, come from the same verb, like only the ta'atea is doubled. And uh, so this is also a, sort of the payback of uh, Yaakov for what he did. Losing uh, Yosef. And what, what will happen then? It says, He tells his father, his mother, what's the point? We're trying to deceive my father, but if he finds out, he will curse me and not bless me. Or in other words, that's not the way to get the baracha. She insists, you have to do it. And she says, your kelala will be on me. Many, many years later, when Yosef is already the viceroy of Egypt and he holds Shimon as prisoner and he tells the brothers, you cannot come back and see me unless you bring your younger brother with you, Binyamin. They go back and they tell Yaakov, the viceroy asked us to bring Binyamin with us. And what is Yaakov's response? He says, Oti shikaltem. You have made me bereft. You took away my children. Yosef enenu, veshimon enenu, veet binyamin tikahu. I've already lost Yosef. Shimon is a prisoner in Egypt. I don't know if he's alive. Now you're going to take binyamin? And then he concludes, alai hayu kulana. All those curses came upon me. He uses the word alai. And this is the key word here. Yaakov tells Rivka, I will bring Kala upon myself. His mother says, no, don't worry, the Kala won't be on you. It will be on, on me, your mother. Years later, he looks back at Rivka, where he passed away, like he's telling her, you were wrong. All these Kalalot, they came upon me. So there's another way of the Torah, for the Torah to tell us that what Yaakov did was wrong. So he goes and he brings it to his mother. She makes food. And she uh, takes those clothes. The, the Midrash says, finds here a, a, a hint that Esav himself did not fully trust his wives and that he let his precious clothes be guarded by his mother. Uh, anyway, She, she, she dresses Yaakov with those clothes. And then she put the, the goat skin on his hands and on the smooth part under the neck, which tells us something about the, uh, the, those clothes of Esav. They did not cover the whole body. It was uh, a sleeveless uh, uh, type of cloth. Otherwise, she doesn't have the cover to cover the hands, right? Uh, it's verse 17. She gives him the food. Okay. Says, who are you, my son? So question, why is he asking, who are you, my son? You sent your son to go get you food, and he comes with food. Why would you think it's not him? So 
the the hints that he could have had was that maybe goat doesn't smell exactly like venison. That's one possibility. The other one, as he says in the next pasuk, you came back too fast from hunting. Another possibility is that Yaakov did not try to make his voice, to make himself sound like Esau. And Yitzhak will speak about that. And finally, this is uh, something that uh, my good friend, a member of the Minyan, Rabbi Ben Rubin, told me as, as an ophthalmologist, this, anything that has to do with eyes interests him in the Tanakh. And he said that it's possible that since Yitzhak just lost the sense of sight, the other senses were not, uh, did not start to recompensate for it. So it was not like a blind person who could uh, easily identify things by, by sound or by touch or by, uh, uh, or by smell. He's sort of in a, in a limbo between losing his eyesight and gaining uh, new senses. In any case, Yaakov tells Yitzhak in verse 19, Vayomer Yaakov el Aviv, I am Esav, your firstborn. There, there are commentators who try to save Yaakov's grace by saying, Yaakov didn't lie. He didn't say, I am Esav, your firstborn. He said, Anochi, it's me. And then he said, Esav, Esav is your firstborn. But it doesn't work with the Tamim. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't sit well. That's not how the trope works. So obviously Yaakov said it out loud. I did as you as you've asked me. Please rise, sit, and eat of my uh, game. So you can bless me. And Yitzhak says, That was very fast. How fast have you found it, my son? Because Hashem, your God, has summoned me, brought me that food. Yitzhak tells Yaakov, come over, I want to feel you. Is it you really you are Esav or not? And Rashi comments here, following in the foot of the Midrash, that Yitzhak's suspicion was aroused because Yaakov, because Esav didn't usually mention Hashem's name. And all of a sudden Yaakov speaks so politely and he says Hashem's name. So that's interesting how the Midrash, on one hand, says that Esav is a wicked person that was able to deceive Yitzhak. On the other hand, Yitzhak knows exactly his, his mannerism and his speech, and he knows that that's not how Esav talks. So it wasn't such a... Uh, the deception was not as perfect as Esav thought. Uh, that's, that's the Midrash. My theory is... As I said before, Yitzhak knew who Esav was. Esav was not one to mention God too often. He wasn't one to talk politely. He was a little brusque, uh, brisk, you know, uh, brusco. I'm like, this is the Spanish word, brusco, you know, for the for the type of behavior, maybe impolite, maybe impulsive. Um, and Yitzhak knew that. And still he wanted him to be a political leader. Yaakov, though, does not make any effort to disguise his voice. And that's why we get in verse 22, the famous Pasuk. Yitzhak feels Yaakov out and he says, Hakol kol Yaakov, I don't get it. It doesn't match. Something is off. So if something is off, why don't you keep investigating? Why don't you say, call your mom. I want your mom to tell me whether you are Yaakov or Esav. It's the easiest thing to do. No, but this was like, that's his Hak's territory. Now he's granting the Baracha. And I, I also feel that he's almost already in the, in the zone of giving the Baracha. There's something that's built up, building up. And it's like a volcano that has to erupt and, and, and rain this Baracha on his son. So we can't delay too much. Um, but his Hak knows that something is wrong. It's really, like I said, still a real why he continues with that. But the question, why didn't Yaakov try to hide, to talk a little bit like Esav? You live for who, may, who knows how many years. The Midrash says they were 80, but maybe it, was, maybe it was 20, 30, whatever. Even if they are teenagers, can't you try to imitate your brother's voice? 
or mannerism of, you know, or, or, or the manner of speech? The answer is no. Yaakov did not want to do that. He wanted to be caught, but he didn't want to walk in and say, tell his father, dad, I'm sorry, but mom made me do it, right? Because he didn't want to, to badmouth his mother. So he said, you know what? I'll just walk in and I'll talk like Yaakov. And my father said, hey, it's Yaakov. What are you doing here? And then it's not me, you know, and the, the whole thing will come up, but at least I'm not going to seal the bracha. But it didn't happen as it was planned, which tells us it's, it's better to tell the truth in real time. Don't wait for the truth to be somehow revealed by someone. And now the Torah says, goes on to say, in verse 23, These two words, the concept of Le'akir, repeats again and again in the story of Yaakov and his children. When So it says here, Yaakov was not recognized by his father. Later on, when the brothers sell Yosef or cause him to be sold, and they tried to hide it by dipping a, his garment in goat's blood, and they give it to Yaakov, what do they say? Hakerna, please recognize. Then Yehuda is deceived by Tamar, and Tamar tells him, please recognize who owns these objects. Then the brothers come to Egypt, and it says they did not recognize Yosef. And it says Yosef recognized them. So the whole thing, this, the, it's amazing how this short uh, paragraph is tied to every part of the story from here to the end of Bereshit. So he says, Vayomer, again, he asks, Vayomer, Ani. It is me. Vayomer, nafshi, lo vayuchal, lo yain. He says, please serve me and I'll eat from your venison and uh, so I can bless you. And he served him and he ate. Lo yain, and here, you can't see it here because there are no ta'amim, but if you look at the Tanakh with the ta'amim, under the word lo, there will be a special tam that's called tere ta'amei. It's like a tevir and another tevir. And in the Sephardic uh, tradition called vayave lo, just like shalshelet, it's a very rare tam, and it's also a tam that, that connotes some confusion. So something was wrong there, there's doubt. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so he brings him the wine and the food. Come and kiss me. He smells his clothes and he says, He says, See, the smell of my son's garment is like the smell of the field that has been blessed by God. And Rashi here makes a comment. He says, so what do you mean? It is, this is the, the field that was blessed by God. Those are goat skins. They were just slaughtered and skinned and made into clothes and, and uh, maybe, not, maybe not fresh, maybe they were older. But if you ever had a chance to smell old skins, they're, it, it doesn't smell good, right? And we don't suspect that they spray them with perfume or something. So Rashi comes with the original solution following in the footsteps of the Midrash, that those clothes were really the clothes of uh, Adam that were uh, inherited by Nimrod, and Isav killed Nimrod, and he took those clothes, and they smelled like an Eden because God made them. Uh, but... So that's, that's a nice interpretation, right? But it's also the tendency of the Midrash to connect things, to make it, uh, to make the narrative more, uh, to make it fuller. But I think is this what I will again mention last time and, and now, Yitzhak loved the field, loved, the, uh, loved being outdoors, not necessarily with the flocks. So for him, that smell is, the, the, he doesn't say, Kereh Gan Eden, right? It's the smell of the field. The, uh, 
Yeah, it reminds me of of uh, as an Israeli song from the I don't know fifties, forties, maybe even the thirties uh, of of the Halutzim. The words are Sadot Shebaimek Kidmuni Reh Hazevel Nihor Hatzir. It's like the fields of the valley give me the welcome, the smell of the of the fertilizer, the uh, the aroma of hay, right? <laughs> um, my sister lived in a kibbutz for seven years. I remember coming off the bus. She lived in Revivim in the south of Israel. So coming off the bus, get off, was you're hit by a, by a, you know by the smell, the cows, of everything, and then after a while you get used to it. It's it's a, it's a not a, it's a heavy smell, but that like just like that song, Sadot Kidmuni. Those are the halutzim who came from Europe to build their house in Eretz Israel. For them, that was the aroma of Gan Eden because that that meant independence, that meant freedom, and I think that's the same thing with with its hak here. Um, so going back to the to the text, and feel free, we have a big group. Anyone has a question or a comment, uh, don't hesitate. You could ask. You could. Uh, I'm not in lecture mode. It just so happened that I'm. But okay, so uh, its hak blesses Yaakov and. He thinks that Esav is in front of him, right? So what is the bracha that he gives him? You will have the dew of heaven and the fat of the earth and uh, plenty of wheat and wine. Nations will serve you. Be a master to your brothers, and the sons of your mother will bow down to you. Meaning, he gives them authority. When he says, your, Those who curse you will be cursed, those who bless you will be blessed, he echoes the bracha of Abraham, but he does not give him the bracha of Abraham. Is He borders on, on Birkat Abraham, but doesn't say it. So, Yitzhak gives Yaakov a very specific blessing, the blessing of abundance and physical power, or political power. It's a very dramatic scene. Yaakov goes out the, the, the tent. Yitzhak comes, I think, uh, for sure, Gustav Dore. Uh, has one of his uh, illustrations of the Tanakh. He has this, maybe Rembrandt also. Uh, there was a scene that, that uh, artists were uh, were drawn to. This guy, because, probably because the, a good story is not, you can't have a good story without a sense of betrayal or doubt or, or, or uh, mistrust. That's where it gets intriguing. So that, that intrigue here, Yaakov deceived his father, and now the victim is coming in. What's going to happen? So here we see the difference between Yaakov's speech as I saw and as Yaakov says, Kumna Sheva please rise and sit and eat so you can bless me. Uh, and Esav says, Yekum aviv yochal, get up and eat. It's a little bit, it's, it's, it's a subtle difference, but something that Yaakov deliberately omitted with the hope that Yitzhak would recognize him, and it didn't happen. It says, it's me, your, your, your firstborn, Esav. Yitzhak trembled exceedingly. So who is this person who brought venison and I ate from it before you came in and I blessed him and he should have the blessing? Why, why does his say let him have the blessing? Because I mentioned before, it was not, uh, for his it was a natural process. He had to do it. It's like rain coming down. He can't bring it back. Um, the the anxiety of Yitzhak could be that uh, he understands what happened and he regrets not being more insistent in trying to figure out who that person is. 
ויאמר, כי שמוע עשה בדברי אביו, ויצעק צעקה גדולה ומרעד מאוד, ויאמר לאביו, ברכני גם אני אבי. Bless me too, he cried out. Here even the Midrash comments that it's an indication that what Yaakov did was wrong. They say that when, when Mordechai heard what Haman was planning to do, he went through the streets of Shushan, ויצעק צעקה גדולה ומרעד, with the same exact word, he raised his voice, and he cried out a great and bitter cry. So that's the, again, another example of the, of we have to pay back for the sins of, ya- for the, for the deception of Yaakov. Vayomer, but already Yitzhak replies, Vayomer ba achincha b'mirma, vayikah b'chatecha. Your brother deceived me, and he took your blessing. And he took your blessing. So even though Yitzhak says, gam baruch yigeh, Meaning I, I cannot curse him, I cannot take the barakha, but the barakha belongs to you, I'm sorry. And he took it. Vayomer, hachi kara shmo Yaakov, vayakeveni ze fa'amayim. It is not for nothing that he's called Yaakov. That's the second time that he robs me. Because the word la'akov, in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, it also means to, to rob. Maybe because it, the Akev is a soul and you follow in someone, uh, you know, following his footsteps. Um, there's also the word Kovea, which also means to rob. So it could be a Sikul Otiot, that the letters change place. And Asaf says here, he, 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 he deceived me twice. And Bechorati Lakah, Vine Ata Lakah Bechati. And Itzhak doesn't respond to the to the issue of the Bechora. But it's interesting to see that after a while, maybe maybe even that very day, I saw looked back and says, how could I have given the Bechora away? It's not that it was completely careless about it, but it was, ca- it was caught in a moment of, uh, of weakness, of vulnerability, uh, and, and he gave it away. Vayaran is hag v'yomer le'esav, hen gevir samtiv lach, v'et kol echav natati lo la'avadim, what can I do? I made him your master. I said that all his brothers should be a servant, and I gave him wine and wheat. So what can I do for you? So that's interesting because you see from the, the way Yitzhak expresses himself that this is not a superficial bracha like we give each other. May you have this, may you have that. For Yitzhak, it's a physical, it's a palpable bracha. He gave him wheat and control and and all that. And I have nothing left give, to give you. Vayomer Isav el Aviv, habaracha hati lecha avi, barcheni gam ani avi. Do you have only one blessing? Can you give a blessing to me too? Vayisa Isav kolo vayevk. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that Esav is the first person who's crying not for someone's death. Right? In, in Bereshit, the, the only time that we have someone crying before that is Avraham comes lispod lesara velivkota. So here's Esav. If you ask, who's the first person who, who cried in Tanakh? Oh, Esav, yeah. Okay, it doesn't really sit well with this character. Unless we say that it is also a deception, but it's not. He's genuinely upset. He says, you will dwell on the fat of the earth and under the dew of heaven. It's not the same thing as he told Yaakov. Yaakov, he says, you will be given the dew and the fat of the earth. To Esav, he says, you will dwell where the fat of the land is. And there are some people say that uh, apparently all the Middle East are descend all the people in the Middle East are descendants of Esav, at least in Kuwait, Bahrain, the you know all the oil uh, uh, the oil economies because they got the bracha of Yitzhak. He said you will dwell on the fat of the earth. It's petroleum. Um, but in any case, Yitzhak says, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't let you off. He's, you're going to live by the sword and serve your brother. And when you rebel, you could rebel against him. So 
at the end of this drama, this one part one of the drama, Yaakov takes the bracha that was meant for Esav. Esav gets no bracha. He gets no bracha. Basically, he says, you will do, we'll live under your brother, and if you rebel, you will be able to overtake him. But you, it's your responsibility. Vayistom Esav et Yaakov ala beracha asher berecho aviv. And Esav resented Yaakov for the bracha that was given to him by his father. Vayomer Esav belibo yikrevu yemei evel avi ve'aharga et Yaakov ahi. Yaakov, Esav says, let me wait until the, uh, my father passes away and the mourning, the mourning period for him is over and then I could kill Yaakov. And Rashi comments, if he correctly here, that, uh, that that shows that Esav respected his father, right? The, uh, uh, otherwise, otherwise he would say, you know, he would not wait for him to, uh, um, he would not wait for, for, for his heart to die. So, um, and also, Remember that uh, Esav never never carried out his threat. He didn't, he didn't even chase Yaakov to uh, to Haran to try to kill him. So that's just he was upset, yes, but he was not a killer. He did not uh, he did not try. Of course, the midrash changed that. The midrash says that Esav sent Eliphaz, his grandson, uh, to to to. Uh, to chase Yaakov, and then he first tried to kill him, and Yaakov said, take all my possessions, because if I have no money, I'm like that. Nothing, nothing of that in the Tanakh. Obviously, Yaakov left for Haran, Esav left him alone, didn't touch him. Esav had respect for his parents and, uh, and did not kill him. Uh, yes, Daphne, you have a question, one second, oh, or a comment. Yeah. Um, it seems to me like um, maybe Esav took what Yaakov said literally. I mean, not what Yitzchak said literally. Then he said, you can throw him off from around your neck. And then Yaakov was gone. And so he was gone, so, so to speak, from around his neck. And so it wasn't oh, necessary. Yeah. Right. Right, but so, but, but still, right. This is an interesting comment. I never thought about it this way. The fact that Yaakov is out of the way and he he's now the only one who lives in the land, it's fine for him. I I'm, I was thinking about you know along these lines of when Yaakov comes back to the land to Canaan, and Asaf goes with 400, 400 men, and we always see this negative as Asaf is going to attack him. We should think about his self defense. From the perspective of Asaf, Yaakov was gone for twenty two years. He's, he controls the land. Now uh, Yaakov is coming to claim back what was given to him by the Bacha of, of Yitzhak. So uh, in any case, the, this hatred, the, I think also that that's the first hatred that we find in Tanakh, Bayistum. What is the next time we find the word hatred in Tanakh? Not the same verb, not Satam, but Sana. I don't know, before that we have, sorry, when the Philistines come to Yitzhak, it says, you hated me. But still, it's one of the first uh, times that we see this, this emotion in Tanakh. When is the next time, someone said? Yosef's brothers. Yosef's brothers. It says, Another example of how those things come back to Hont Yaakov. Nehama. Yeah, what's bothering me is that not only did he not give Esau a blessing, but he kind of cursed him. I mean, if his, if, he's, if his blessing is so strong that he can't take it back, why did he have to say you're going to live by the sword and you're going to serve your brother? Why couldn't he just leave it with the beginning part? No, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a curse. It, he, he, what he tells him, there's a way out. There's a way out, meaning... I did make him your master, but you could opt out if you want. But you have to take it by force. Can you go over that verse again then? So in verse 40, it says, by the sword you shall live. 
So he says you should continue your way of life by the sword, as a hunter, as a warrior, but serve your brother as long as as uh, as long as uh, as he's powerful. But if you were able to rebel, you can do that. The midrash took it differently. tarid. They said it's for the word tered, and it's about Yaakov. When Yaakov goes down, you will go up. And then the uh, the rabbi said that this is like an eternal struggle between Yaakov and Esav. It became like the yin yang. You know, Yaakov is good, Esav is evil. And uh, uh, when when the Jews are up, Rome is down. When Rome is up, the Jews are down. Um, it's it's a very binary, very simplistic way to see the world. But this is the way that the the rabbis had to. Um, to present to the listeners at the time of after the destruction, like we are, we are good, they're evil. And right now they took advantage of this opportunity given to them by, uh, by Yitzhak. Um, there's also an interesting uh, story in the Talmud. We don't know if it's true or not, uh, if this was really something that took place, but they say, the rabbi said that once, every 70 or seven years, the Romans would bring two people, one of whom was lame, was, was limping, to symbolize Yaakov, who was limping after he passed Penuel, after he fought with the angel. And they would uh, make that lame person carry a healthy man on his shoulders. And they would dress him with the, again, according to that legend, with the skin, they took off, they, 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 they skinned Rabbi Ishmael alive and made from the face of his skin a mask that they put, made this Roman person wear to say that he's the Jew. And they say, this is the, this is the, uh, the crook that deceived our master. So, uh, and, and also, so, I mean, I don't know that it has a, you know historical validity, but it's interesting. Uh, the rabbis were aware at one point, even though they weren't saying, that, at least whoever said that, Midrash, felt that there is some price to pay for that deception that went from Yaakov to Esau. Daphna? Yeah, I was thinking that the way you've presented the story is really, really interesting because it makes it seem like the, this overall message is that whatever your strength is, be careful how you use it. Like uh, Rifka was very uh, like active and assertive and could like make things happen, right? It was willing to like do stuff and she like overreached with that. And like um, Yaakov was like maybe like learned and studied and gentle and maybe compassionate maybe didn't want to be too strong and he like failed to like assert himself because he was way into that area and um you know Esav was like very like physically powerful and it like got the better of him and you know just like it seems like and even even you talk with a blessing you know like he had this ability to channel these blessings but he, he like he couldn't like somehow like manage it like you know uh, he just needed to do it he couldn't like have some kind of I don't know self I don't know what say self-control may be the wrong word but you know it, it just seems like yeah. it's like maybe be careful with what your gifts are I don't know, <laughs> you know it's, it's an interesting perspective Daphna it's really beautiful insight that that what, what Daphna just said is beautiful because you Actually, you find like the, the common thread to those four protagonists. Like this one family, they're very close together, right? And each one of them doesn't realize, doesn't, doesn't uh, fully control what they have. Like you said, Yitzhak, had to, had, Yitzhak should have stopped himself and ask, investigate further, you know, where does your blessing come from? Rivka should have stopped herself and say, that's not the way to act. Maybe I should go and talk to my husband and say, what do you think about our children? And then she will find that he knows a little bit about Esav and Yaakov. Yaakov should have stopped himself and not say, okay, I'll try to, you can't please everyone, right? It's like, if you wanna, 
I don't want to offend my mom. I don't want to offend my dad. You end up offending the whole world. Uh, and and I saw being impulsive, uh, like you said, he's he's emotional. He shows hatred. He shows uh, uh, agony. He shows he shows love also. Um, but so none of them were maybe the word is self awareness, like aware of how they operate, not in just in their own bubble, what, but with others as well, and what the implications are. So, and I think this is, this is, this really contributes to what, you know, I call this whole book, the book of communication, right? Is that, that what Sefer Bereshit teaches us is how to, how to interact with other people and not, not to live in a, um, in a certain disconnect. And that's something that cannot be legislated. This is the, maybe the most important part of the Torah. And also, uh, the most uh, compelling, the part of the Torah, really is Bereshit, the story. I, 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 it doesn't cease to amaze me. Every year, when we go back to it, where I study with people those stories, we get into this family. It's like uh, the way that you don't connect to any other biblical character or any character from uh, you know mythical times. You know people know about Oedipus and you know and the compass and all, but we are, every year we go back. It's like okay, so what did Abraham think? What did Yitzhak think? Like what was going on here? What did Yaakov and his children? And that's really beautiful how the the, the biblical narrative pulled us in. Uh, Yoel, uh, thank you, Daphna. Thank you so much, Yoel and uh, thank you, Rabbi. I wanted to say that I I find this. Also, so much of Bereshi powerful and this story unbelievably powerful. And the thing that is really weighing on me here is that uh, in some sense, um, I don't find Yaakov to be at fault or Esau or Rivka. I find the content of the bracha to be at fault. And the fact that there is only one bracha and one, and Hevekavir Lachacha, that someone has to be on the, you know, that's so much of Bereshi is why does God accept uh, you know, Hevel and not Kai. And why is there, why is there, are there seldom, and I say seldom because Avraham is an exception, that's an expansive, that's an incredibly expansive bracha, but so often we seem to have a zero sum game and either you're on top or you're on bottom, there never seems to be, and when Esav, you know, enough to go around, and when Esav says, you know, I find it to be you know, it's sort of like the system is, you know, something is wrong with the system, <laughs> it seems, right. you know, with a lot of this. Yeah, it's true. Uh, that's a good point. And I, 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 like I mentioned before, I feel that it's hot was pulling towards the direction of having Yaakov and Asab work together. But once Yaakov came in and took the Baracha by force or with deception, it's hot sort of, uh, maybe that's part of his anxiety, Mark realizes that this thing is not going to work, maybe because that's the nature of men, that someone always wants to be in control. It's so hard for us to, to work in, in a network and to work together. And that's why he tells, it's Hak tells Yaakov in verse 40, you have to live by your sword and try to uh, uh, overpower your brother because together you're not going to work. But you're right, this is a, this is a sad pattern that we see here. Uh, Miriam? I was wondering how do the rabbi see it if, say, Esau did get the blessing, would things, would Yaakov still be our paternal lineage, uh, or would he always still just be under Esau's hand? How, how would that work? I mean, so that's, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. So that, that's, <laughs> I think that's the, uh, that's the reason why the Midrash, the, and the rabbis and the Midrash uh, went with the notion that what Yaakov did was good because they said, what do you want? Do you want us to be descendants of Esav? Esav would be the, the heir of Yitzhak. It's impossible, right? They couldn't perceive Esav as the successor of Abraham. Uh, but that's why I'm saying that the alternative to Yaakov getting the bracha by deception is not that, it's, that Esav is the uh, the successor of Abraham, but rather Yaakov is the heir of Abraham spiritually as the leader, as the educator, and Esav is the statesman. He's the one who's leading the army, the, the state, whatever. And then where do we see that? We have to go on and read that. 
So Rivka is being told what Yaakov, what I sub said, and I so maybe I'll keep that question and we'll see it in the, uh, in the as we go on. Rivka warns Yaakov that I sub wants to kill you. Uh, now listen to me and run away to again she has to command him. But no, the irony, he didn't want to go and bring that food to his father. And what did she say? In verse 8, listen to me, everything is going, when you say listen to me, well, it means trust me, right? Everything is going to be okay. But it wasn't because she has to say again, listen to me, run away. So, right, the Rivka's plan didn't really work. Uh, it says, sit there until your brother comes down. Uh, I don't want to lose both of you on one day because if you'll fight, both of you will be dead. And Rivka tells Yitzhak, I can't live with those Hittite women. I I don't want him to marry uh, a woman from the daughters of Het. And Yitzhak knows what Rivka is doing. I, I don't think that by that point, Yitzhak doesn't understand that Rivka is trying to uh, save face, and, but he loves her. So he doesn't say, and this part of, but part, it's part of the problem of not saying what's going on. Yitzhak should have gone to Rivka and say, what have you done? Why did you push Yaakov? To, no, but then they all keep it under the, this is not, this is not good. Um, but anyway, Yitzhak calls Yaakov and blesses him. Don't take a Canaanite woman. Go to Padan Aram, to Betuel, and take a wife. And then look what he does in verse 3 of chapter 28. What does he do? The Almighty will bless you. And will make you fruitful and it will multiply you. And you become a great nation. And will give you the blessing of Abraham. To you and your descendants. And you will inherit the land that Hashem gave Abraham. So what is it? Is it just fortifying the bracha that he gave him before? It's a different blessing. It doesn't say prior to that, he says that you will get the dew and the fat of the earth, right? Here it specifies the place. You're going to get the land where you were a sojourner that Hashem gave Abraham. You are the successor of Abraham. You will get the bracha of Abraham. But didn't you say that you ran out of brachot? Why did you give this bracha to Esav when Esav said, please give me another bracha. No, I'm sorry, I'm writing out of brachot. What about this one over there on the shelf? You know, nicely wrapped, says Birkat Avraham. Can you give this to me? Oh no, I'm saving it for Yaakov. But he already, he already got one, he got mine. Yeah, but this is really his, I can't give it to you. See, what, what I mean, there are two blessings. There are clearly two blessings. One blessing is Tala Shamayim Shmane Haaretz, the dew of the heaven and the, and the fat of the earth and mastery over your, whatever. And here, it doesn't say you will be a master of your brothers. You'll be a great nation, a populous nation, in the sense of you will be a light unto the nations. You will, you will spread. So it says, we could say, in a, if you want to distill the essence of the two barachot, it's the physical bracha and the spiritual bracha. And Yitzhak was going to give this, the physical bracha to Esav, the huntsman, the the man of the field, and the spiritual bracha to Yaakov, the one who dwells in the tent, and together they would rule, or even side by side, each one will have his, 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 uh, his style. But Yitzhak knew exactly who his children were. Unfortunately, if God did not talk to him, did not tell him about the oracle, did not tell him about her, her concerns, and that's how we ended up. Just to, I'll just wrap this up, and then see if anyone has questions. So Yitzhak sends him away. What happens next? Now Esav tries to, what's going on? blessed He sent him to Padan Aram, to get a wife. He blessed him. And he commanded him, Lo so Esav tries to understand this. What's going on? My brother was commanded by my father to go to Canaan, and he listened to them, and he went and he got a blessing. Conclusion, 
if you are going to marry the wife whom your parents approve of, you're going to get a blessing. Right? Because that's an else, you know, like a doctor, you analyze, or a scientist, you analyze what has changed. What is the new factor that could have caused the bracha to come? Only the fact that Yaakov is going to fetch a, a wife, right? To find a, a wife in, in Haran. He says, oh, so maybe if I get married now to a wife that my parents approve of, I will get a blessing. So what does he do? He realized that Yitzhak doesn't like the, the, the girls of Canaan. He goes to his uncle, Ishmael. And he marries Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, his cousin, in, in addition to his already uh, existing two wives. I think that, that really the feeling here should be uh, pity on Esav. You know what, what he feels? He's like this child who says, why do my parents not like me? What did I do wrong? And he says, oh, wrong wife. Okay, let me go get the right wife, like my brother. Maybe I'll get a blessing. No blessing. So <clears throat> this is sort of to wrap up this, you know, chapter 27, 28, the beginning of 28, very, very gripping and powerful story. And uh, we'll, we'll pause here and see if anyone has more questions or comments uh, on that. Because I see a couple of hands up, but I think they're from before. So I don't know if there are no questions or comments. Uh, yeah, Shnehama. Okay. So one thing I noticed, I get distressed with this story because I really feel like Aesop was in a scan. It's, 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 yeah. it's low naive. <laughs> but anyway, the one thing I wanted to ask is I just noticed in the last thing you read that it said Lotase lo when he went to don't take a wife and something that came up in our Hebrew class, actually, I think it was Miriam that asked it. And maybe you can answer this in in uh, the Chumash. What what is the difference between saying lo and al? Because we know in the Aserah to Debrot it says al versus lo, and I, I wasn't qualified to answer the question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, I don't want to answer off the cuff. Uh, I, mean, I, I would say that in most cases they are uh, interchangeable, but I think that al also means stop. Unlike lo. Lo is don't or not. Al, uh, al can be also please stop. Like when Lot confronts the people uh, who try to... Uh, to punish his guest, he says, Alna Ahaitareu. Alna, please don't. Don't do that. Uh, so I think that's that's the uh, uh, that's the the difference, but I, I'll do uh, I'll I'll search more. Well, I was asking because in uh, Megilla um, Esther, when she sends Mordecai to I mean when she's yeah, she sends uh, uh More, was it, no, who was that? She sent us someone to Mordecai and she says, yeah. uh, put, and so it was like, put your hands on him, like ordination. And it said, instead, it said all instead of L. And so when she says, instead of, and then the next uh, verse, it said, go to him. And in the Hebrew, and in this one, it said, go like on him. So it was almost interpreted as, as uh, this person, I forgot his name, the, the one that she sent to Mordecai to tell him uh, at the gate to put like your ordination on him. Oh, and so, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, ha I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up. I'm going to look it up in the, in the text. Okay. Yeah, okay. Very that was good. Why I was asking. Okay. okay, so uh, in terms of, uh, of, of this chapter, in, uh, um, I mean, this is the end of one story. But the beginning of the saga of Yaakov, because now everything that unfolds is from from what Yaakov did to herself. Yes, you had. I just want to say that um, a beautiful, first of all, this beautiful explanation of the different brachot, and but I also want to say that, and maybe going along with your with everything you're saying, is that 
it says in Hay, uh, Pasuk Hay, Vayishlach Yitzchak Yaakov, and it says, uh, all, uh, uh, he went to Lavan, Ben Betuel Arami, Achi Rivka, Aim Yaakov Esav. And I wonder if the Aim Yaakov Esav is a rebuke of Rivka, that she was the mother of both, but she acted as the mother of one. It's possible. It's maybe even Yitzhak says it, you know, that, that we, we, you both came from there. We are connected. Yeah, very possible. Um, anyway, you know, thank you for this comment. And we'll see you at 745 uh, for our Vit. Um, and uh, we'll continue learning. Thank you.